Clearly, we're looking at lots of other spaces in terms of epilepsy and, and, and potentially the difference between CBD and THC. And so there was a, a, there was a poll of about 5,000 Canadians about two months ago by uh, one of these industry, uh, com industry uh, venture capitalist companies. And of the 5,000 people, 85% uh, said yes, this should be legal, and 75% said it absolutely should be used and treated as a medicine. And so very few things from a public opinion perspective are so polarized in one direction. So we know now that our federal government has said July 2018, this will become a legal uh, product uh, for, uh, from a recreational standpoint. However, the provinces still have to decide how the public has access to this. And sure enough, they've given physicians still the prescription pad until that date, and clearly the prescription pad will be utilized kind of moving forward. So the question becomes when physicians start to prescribe medical cannabis, and if you ever walk into your doc's office and you say, you know, uh, I'd like medical cannabis, and they tell you something like, well, it's illegal for me to prescribe, or I, I don't do that, you can be rest assured that that's not true. Okay? If you have an MD and you have a prescription pad, you're authorized to prescribe. Whether you choose to prescribe is another, is an, is another story altogether. And so let's first talk a little bit about the venture capitalist world, and then we'll talk a little bit about the medical side of things. And so up until now, so the, uh, when the, they used to be called the MMPR guidelines, which were longstanding. Ten years ago, I would have patients come into my clinic, and they'd have a, you know, a tibial fracture. They broke their leg. They've tried their opioids. They've been on their anticonvulsants. And they say, Doc, you know, the only thing that works for me is I take two puffs of cannabis in the morning, two puffs in the afternoon, and two puffs at the end of the day. And that just enables me to function. And I'd say, great, good for you, uh, uh, and off you go kind of thing. But again, I had no way to prescribe it at that point in time, other than if they went through the, the federal channel. So this has been around for a long time. This is not something that's new. For 30, 50, uh, thousands of centuries, mummies were buried with it. This is something that has been around uh, long enough. And if, for those of you that want to look back into the 1940s when the US outlawed this and made this a, uh, uh, a regulated substance, there's a lot of stories as to how it was being brought up through Mexico and, 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 the, and the different properties that were being seen by uh, the Mexican immigrants and, and then moving in a direction against cannabis. And so we're kind of now working backwards in terms of where we're going to land with this medicine. So it's not the utopia. Clearly, you know, the, the, the biggest debate that we have is the pain world has kind of gravitated to the fact that this is going to land somewhere. The psychiatry world, on the other hand, thinks this is the antichrist. They actually think this is worse than the cigarette and tobacco industry was 50 years ago. And there might be some truth to that in terms of what we're seeing happen as people go down the, the, the route of moving into cannabis. And so, you know, I can prescribe someone, and the evidence, let's talk about the science. We have pretty solid evidence and science with respect to inhalational. We know how it's absorbed. We know the peak effect is about 15 minutes, and we know in about two to four hours, most of that effect is gone if you're smoking, two, you know, 0.2 to 0.3 grams, so two or three puffs. However, if you move into now the oils, and I can tell you that if you went to any of the 43 licensed producers in the country now, and you looked for a CBD type bud or, or cannabis, you can't find it. And so what they've done is they've now gravitated to the oils, but we have no evidence for the oils, but I can tell you that when someone starts to take cannabis oil and they gravitate to that, they typically are spending you know, $150 uh, for about 60 mils, and they're ramped up to about two mils a day, and every 11 to 12 days, guess what you have to buy? You have to buy more oils. So I think before we jump into the, the area of the oils, et cetera, we need to have the science behind it. And so what happens is I will prescribe vaporized, and I don't prescribe you rolling a joint. It's not what I do. Vaporizing is uh, potentially a little bit better for your lungs, and ultimately, yeah, you can control uh, your intake a little bit better, and that's what I prescribe. But the problem is you then go to the other physicians who are very well-meaning, and they'll tell you, smoking is bad for you, shouldn't smoke, let's use the oils. And my patients come back to me on these oils, which for the most part, when you look at what is in the marketplace, their, their variance is anywhere from 20 to 30 percent. Is there any medicine that any physician will ever prescribe you with a variance of 20 to 30 percent? And so, you know, how many milligrams of THC is actually in that oil? The Globe and Mail's done a couple expose, and you can see sometimes it's one fifth, one fourth, one third, and we really have no standardization. So the medical side of things, and so that's the venture capitalist side who clearly have a role to play. Uh, the government has just announced they're giving out 40 more licensed producers over the next uh, eight months, and clearly there's method to that madness. The more licenses out in the marketplace, the cost comes down, and, and, the, and the public is somewhat protected with, with competition. 
So move forward two or three years. We have, we'll have this recreational boom. Supposedly, we'll have this huge peak in people using cannabis. I'm not sure it's going to be as big as they think it will be. But what we have to make sure, and you know, I'm always on uh, the radio or, or, or talking about the opioid crisis. And so if we head down the cannabis road in 20 years without regulating and without controlling kind of how this rolls out to our public, we might have the vegetable crisis. And the entire world is actually looking at Canada, right? They're looking at us. We've decided this is something we're going to embrace, and this is something that's going to land in the medical space. And it will land in the medical space, but we really have to protect our 13 and our 14-year-old boys and girls, in particular, that start to use high-dose THC. In 2003, the highest percentage THC you could find in the marketplace was about 4 or 5%. You now have boutique uh, LPs that have cannabis stocked for July next year of 25%, 26%, all right? So we have to educate the public, we have to educate our physicians, we have to give people the direction in terms of how you navigate the space. And you know, when I first started prescribing in 2014, I would give scripts and people would walk out the door and they would end up in a dispensary and I've had a couple calls from the eMERGE, you know, in terms of paranoia and things of that nature. And so you have to understand that the dosing for a naive person, maybe like many of you who've never smoked cannabis, is quite different different to that person that has always been using recreational marijuana. And so two very different individuals. And so when you, what I often do before I even go down the road of prescribing cannabis is have the patient do some homework. So if you want to go down this road, and I think it's reasonable for you, first we start down the neuropathic pain guidelines, and we'll do the typical medications, and we're failing on some of these, and then it makes sense. So in Canada, we've moved cannabis up to a third-line medication. In other parts of the world, they say that cannabis is not only not a third-line medication, there's a weak recommendation against. And that's basically the differences in the way that we've approached and looked at the literature. And so I remember in about five years ago, when I stood there in uh, it was a conference in Whistler at the Canadian Pain Society, and we were debating where is cannabis going to fall over the next three to four years in Canada? Mark Ware, who some of you might know that name, he is the kind of godfather of cannabis in Canada, had a good portion of the room convinced that cannabis should be above the opioid, just from a harm reduction standpoint. So clearly, you know, the opioid crisis, opioid deaths, it's very hard to smoke yourself to death. And so that was kind of the premise of moving cannabis up above the, above the opioid. And so when we look at where the opioids are sitting now and cannabis in juxtaposition, it'll be interesting to see what happens the next time around as we modify these guidelines again. And I can honestly say that, you know, from a cancer perspective, and a palliative pain perspective, I've had a few patients in the last couple of years that you know, have come to me, they're very complex, they're probably near the end of life, pal very palliative, and I've had that, you know, they're in front of me, the loved one's with them, and we're chatting about what next? You know, they've probably got you know, a month, two months, maybe three months to live, so to speak, and not on an opioid, not on a cannabinoid. And I thought to myself, I should probably try the cannabinoid, but opted for the opioid. And I actually think in a couple of those scenarios, I precipitated someone's death, the respiratory depression, confusion, an eMERGE visit, and death. And why wouldn't I have gone with cannabis first to give them that temporary relief that is an onset, offset, and just give them some comfort? And so we're really now at the ballpark of figuring out where this is going to land. It clearly has a role, and we'll, we'll kind of figure it out as we move forward. So I think with that, I think that's kind of the landscape in terms of where we sit, and happy to take some questions.